Hello, and welcome to SCAD Savannah Film Festival, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm EW's Chancellor Agard, and tonight I'm joined by bad hair writer, producer, and director, Justin Simeon. Justin, welcome. Hey. Um, How's it going? Good to be here. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm, I'm shooting Dear White People Season 4 uh, and releasing a movie, which is like, you know, it's, it's, it's too many blessings to count, but I'm, I'm exhausted, but I'm happy. Uh, it's so I want to start with bad hair, actually, since, since, since that's what people just watch at the festival. Um, I, I know for you, this is this movie draws on several things that you're passionate about. Uh, I would love to first can you talk about some of those inspirations that went into this movie and helped bring to the screen. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was like, you know, I'd seen this movie called The Wig. I was really obsessing over like the way uh, hair is used in Asian horror movies and really not finding anything that spoke to a hair experience in America that, you know, spoke to me that was black. Uh, and it was really kind of this crazy idea that I actually really, I dismissed <laughs> and realized I love horror movies. I love psycho thrillers and I've never thought that I could write one. Why is that? Oh, because I've never seen myself in any. Mm -hmm. And out of that anger and, and surprise and, you know, realization, that's kind of why I did it. I sort of, I always get mad first. Uh, that's how I know I really want to make something because I'm like, what? I didn't think I had permission to do this because of systemic racism. I'm doing it, you know, or whatever it is. And, uh, and one of the things that I, I really was attracted to is that I don't think there's any other genre that is like right in the middle of pop culture and pure cinema, like, uh, like horror and thriller movies. You, you, you're just sort of, you're creating a dream for people very intentionally. And, uh, you can kind of get away with a lot of crazy stuff as a filmmaker. Uh, and yet it's accepted because it's in the form, it's in a form that we expect those things, you know, from, and it just seemed like a lot of fun, to be honest. It felt like I could say something important, but also just have fun making it. Uh, we're joined by a lot of film students that are watching this. I'm curious for you. I mean, with, with, in terms of the horror genre, was that something that you were, that you fell in love with at an early age? Was, was, it, was that something that you were in, like, exposed <laughs> to in college? Uh, I guess how um, how familiar. Yeah, so the se the second movie I ever remember. The first one is The Wiz, <laughs> which maybe tracks. Uh, <laughs> the second movie I remember seeing is Nightmare on Elm Street Two. Um, I saw it at a very young age. Uh, my aunt Zora. All the women in the film are named after my mom and her her sisters. But my aunt Zora, who watched me and loved movies, you know, she let me watch whatever she was watching, and she loved Freddy Krueger, and she loved like Superman and. It was a big genre household. So I watched all that stuff at a really young age, did not realize what the basic plot was. I was that young. I did not realize what the plot was. I didn't realize, oh, I'm supposed to be identifying with the white children who are trying to run away from Freddy. <laughs> I thought Freddy was like funny and had a cool hand and I liked his hat. Like I didn't get, I didn't get it as a kid. So like I, I was in just stuff in a purely kind of visceral sense, uh, you know, really all my life. And I, I was obsessed with the Nightmare on Elm Street series. And as I, as I began to kind of figure out what kind of filmmaker I wanted to be, um, you know, Kubrick was my gateway into so-called serious horror uh, with The Shining. And um, I don't know, I just kept, I kept just sort of inhaling these, these filmmakers that would toe that line between camp and B-movie uh, and serious social commentary. Uh, mm -hmm. So many films like that come out of the 70s and 80s. And I feel like, I don't know, those were always the movies I gravitated towards because they were fun, but they were also important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they managed to do both. I remember when we spoke at New York Comic Con, uh, because this movie is very much not only a black movie, but it's a, it's a movie told from, a female, a, a, from, from the perspective of a black female. And yeah, I remember you mentioned how you uh, brought a lot of your friends to on like a retreat and just sort of picked their brains about this movie and your ideas and hearing their perspective since it is somewhat different from yours. Uh, I'm curious for you, what was sort of the most valuable thing you got out of that retreat that, that you then applied to writing this movie? Well, the most valuable thing is I, I figured, I, I realized what the movie was about. You know, there is, I knew it was hair. I knew it was going to be dealing with like I, the, the, is, the set of issues that would come up in the film. I knew that, but like, I wanted to find a, my personal connection with the film, what I needed to say in the film, that was not going to just like override the experience of any woman uh, watching it or whose live lives that I was you know, seeking to portray. I didn't want to sort of, I feel like gay men and black women, black gay men and black women, but really all gay men, 
you know, we have a very symbiotic relationship, but there are ways to cross a line. And I didn't want to do that. Um, and what was what we came to as a unit in that first retreat is just this feeling that like ambition and authenticity are at odds when you're black uh, for anybody, but particularly when you're black, because black people, we have less um, ability to be authentic and uh, without male privilege, black women you know, they really, they have to fit in a very narrow slice, not too angry, not too nice, not too, you know. Code switching. Just, code switching. It just yeah. felt like, oh my God, what an impossible grinder to go through. If you were a black woman and you want to be president, which we're, you know, we're on the heels of, of you know, Kamala, obviously. But the feeling in, for, for all of the women in the room was like, I don't know. Like, I feel like I have to limit my ambition because to get anywhere in the society means there's more of myself I have to leave on the cutting room floor. I can't bring all of myself. And when we got to that, that was like the tragic sticking point for me. Like that was the thing I would think about. And I would just sort of tear up inside because I can relate to that feeling. Like the, the tragedy of the black experience, like who would I have been if I wasn't limited in the ways that I'm not even conscious of? Like I'm aware of, of systemic racism, but it takes me a while to realize how it's impacted me because it's so subtle and it's so subversive. And, you know, what are those opportunities that I'll never have? You know, what are the what are the things that will not occur to me in this lifetime? Like, you know, oh, you should make a horror movie that occurred to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know to even dream that until I'm in my mid 30s. What am I going to die? What am I going to go out, you know, without having ever thought of it or realized it? And that thought is where I, I, I built the, the whole movie from. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I'm, I'm glad you brought the idea of not ever thinking of, of doing a horror movie because I know we've, again, it's, we've talked on a lot of articles recently about how sort of Get Out was a turning point that Get Out ha comes from the tradition of black filmmakers using this genre to make social commentary going back to Tales from the Hood and, uh, and Ganja and Hess and Black and all that. But it, that's where people realize, oh, there's money to be made. They finally realize there's money to be made and allowing filmmakers to do this. For you then, in, and as you're sort of making this movie, developing this idea, I mean, and taking it to potential financiers, I mean, what were the things that you sort of, I guess, I guess, held your ground on and made sure that you wanted to keep in this movie and, and what you did to sort of maintain your artistic integrity? Because I think that's another thing students will be interested in learning is sort of how to keep your artistic integrity while navigating capitalism. Right. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's a push-pull. I, I actually, mm -hmm. like, I hate you know, getting notes like everybody, it hurts, you know, I hate, you know, receiving negative feedback, it hurts. It's always so laborious to like rewrite the thing a billion times. But the truth is, is that like something wonderful comes out of that process. So for me, it's about identifying what are the absolutely important things that I have to fight for no matter what. And typically those things are more, more so about the story that I'm telling. They're more so about like, no, this is not a movie about because yeah, you know there's always a sin in a horror movie the, the character always does something subtly wrong before they get the you know the horror happens to them uh and i was like it can't be getting the weave like i knew that it was like i can't judge anna for getting the weave it is not it is not about whether or not you wear your hair straight or curly that is not the conversation that i want to get into the conversation i want to get into is that this is about the system that gives a person like anna two choices eviction or weave that's the problem okay because the truth is anna should be able to wear her hair any way she wants to and she should be able to come to that conclusion in her own natural process she shouldn't be sort of forced to you know ruin <laughs> her hair and her head and just give it over to these mysterious people who are going to do god knows what with it you know or else like that shouldn't be the that's that's not uh, that's not how you know it should work mm -hmm. and so things like that I'm, I'm pretty particular on and those are actually the things that you know, my collaborators tend to really respect about me. A lot is up for conversation, though. You know, I, I usually come in with really specific ideas, but they're, they're specific ideas to achieve like an ultimate purpose. You know, like I'm trying to say something. And as long as that something is still being said, there might be an, a better way to say it. And that better way to say it may come from a note that I don't want to take, or it may come from a bit of feedback that sounds crazy at first, or it, it may come from an accident that I make. You know, that actually, like, let's lean into that and let's try to do that again. Um, you know, I, there's, a, there's a quote from Quincy Jones 
uh, I believe, uh, from the We Are the World recording sessions, that he likes to leave the, stu- the, the door to the studio open just a crack so that God can come in. And, and, and my acting coach in, in, in high school would call it happy accidents, but there really is an, a degree of spontaneity and unplanned forness that makes the great movies the great movies. I, I read, um, and I highly suggest, there's a book called Space Odyssey about the making of 2001 and Space Odyssey from the perspective of, of Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke's letters that they were writing back to each other. And things like the obelisk, you know, that, that sort of perfect black rectangle that's floating through space, mm-hmm. complete, they happened upon that. He wanted a pyramid. He wanted a glass pyramid, and they made one, and it looked like crap. And so they were like, okay, well, here's, let's just take this matchbox and paint it matte black and see what happens. And it was like, <laughs> oh, and that's where that came from. And you, you watch something like 2001 A Space Odyssey, and you go like, oh, my God, everything here has a completely like conscious intent for being in the movie. And that's true, but unconscious choices are also important in a movie. You have to give, I think, I have to give space for like, the part of me that has not sort of made a logic case in my mind to just make a mistake or stumble into something or go like, uh, I want the camera to do that. You mm-hmm. know, like that part of me is also part of my, my arsenal as a filmmaker and um, giving myself permission to use both of those sets of my head uh, to me is like super important. So I, I'm not that precious. I mean, you know, I, I thankfully I've been making, you know, smaller budgeted independent projects. So I've not run into a bunch of scenarios where like I want something fundamentally different than the people, you know, financing the film. What was a happy accident during Bad Hair? Oh my gosh, so many. I would say once we started to look at tests of the hair and what it did in water, Mm -hmm. uh, that gave me a lot of information and ideas of like what, how to describe the hair or what to plan for it to do. That sequence where kind of materializes out of this hair floating up from the ground, you know, that stuff really came from just us doing some tests with the hair and seeing, you know, what it did under different circumstances. Uh, There's, there's many sequences in the movie that came out of dreams or came out of um, artists. You know, I I kept a lot of Lorna Simpson uh, work around me. She does these beautiful collages uh, with black uh, women cut out of big black magazines. And she does these watercolor paintings of like hair jutting under their heads and like, so much of that stuff, like just for me, just needs to get into the unconscious mm-hmm. and then come back. <laughs> you know, that's so much of the process, uh, at least for me in the early stages. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the happy accidents are, are, are countless. <laughs> um, I want to talk about Elle, who I think is fantastic in this movie. And, I, and, I, and, and, and also, I know you guys go way back. I mean, yeah. when you were casting Elle, and I guess, what were you looking for and what made Elle sort of jump out to you in, your, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the audition process? I mean, she had this like Shelley Duvall black thing going on. Uh, I'd known her for years. Um, I knew that, you know, as a, as a so-called final girl, you know, there's a, there's a sense of, of fra- I think of Mia Farrow as kind of like the, you know, ideal uh, woman at the center of a movie like this, because she is both frail and strong. She is both, you know, vulnerable from the forces around her, but uh, has a bite in her that lets us know that she can overcome this. Um, she's both wise and naive. There's this dichotomy in like the famous, you know, I, I don't want to call them screen queens, but like female protagonists. And um, I'm always looking for someone who's going to pretty much give me what I envisioned, but then also like bring this layer to it that I, I couldn't have expected that works in ways that I can't imagine. And Elle gave me that, you know, it is true. It is true. There really great people will come in for a role, but when it's the right person and you're really tuned into the story you're telling, you just kind of feel it in your body. It's like a shiver. You know, when she started doing that, those lines, I just, I just found myself just sinking into her performance and going, I will care about this girl, no matter what happens, no matter how, you know, if I fuck up the dialogue or if I didn't write that scene good, like she's going to make me care anyway. And, um, and that's what it was for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, as someone who grew up sort of watching, uh, especially watching like Dan Jackson's Velvet Rope concert tour and like the All For You concert on repeat, I really appreciated the uh, Kelly Rowland's character and these music. Can you, can you talk about sort of, like, I guess, uh, who, I guess, who wrote those songs and sort of, and, and, and I guess making music such a fundamental part of this movie? 
So again, you know, I, I realized very early in the process that a key to making a movie like this for me had to be to lean into all of my obsessions and eccentricities. <laughs> That's where the great moment, you, you can't think your way into blood coming out of the elevator in the shot. <laughs> you just can't, you can't like do a math equation and sort of find yourself, uh, you know, into the sequence in, uh, you know, Psycho with the, with, with the shower curtain. I mean, yes, he came up with like a cut pattern. And that was a mental problem, but it has to start with like a, an idea. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes from what you're obsessed about. And I've been making songs uh, for really since I was a kid. I, I'm not a musician. I'm not, at least I haven't been a, a trained musician, um, but I listened to pop music at a very young age. You know, my first, al I had albums. <laughs> I had, you know, uh, eight tracks from my dad. Like I, I loved pop music growing up as a kid. I loved New Jack Swing. I didn't know. We didn't know it was called that at the time, but like I listened to Janet and Bobby and, and you know, the Jungle Fever soundtrack and, uh, you know, Dangerous and like all of those those albums that came out of that era. And 1989 just felt like the right year. It was the year when the weave sort of becomes a part of the public consciousness. And it was also really the year of Janet Jackson's, you know, cement into the, the stratosphere. What began in Pleasure Principle with her flipping off that chair with that long flowing hair you know, became Rhythm Nation and those looks and es escapade and all that stuff. And so, you know, Sandra was very much Janet plus Jody plus Karen White. You know, it's those three women kind of amalgamated together. All of them, their, their, their long flowing hair that would just kind of whip around as they danced was a big part of their identity. And I think a big part of probably popularizing that style of hair among Black women you know, for which I have no judgment on that piece of it. Um, but this, this, this way that like our role models, they inspire us, but sometimes they can kind of lead us down paths that aren't really good for us. I just found that really compelling and interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my heart of hearts, like it'd be fun to set this alongside real world events, but there was no way to do that. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to make a statement about the music of the time, because if you listen to those songs like Poison, which is like one of my favorite songs, or Secret Rendezvous, or Affair by Shirelle, or, you know, name it, Do Me Baby, whatever the song is, like, they're such bops, they're so good. But oh my God, the lyrics are problematic. Like, <laughs> Poison is basically like, distrust any beautiful woman, just distrust mm -hmm. her because she's beautiful. And she's smiling at you and she's being nice. Don't trust her. She's evil. Like, that's crazy, you know? And, and so many of these baby making songs are like, that's, you're describing rape, sir. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, or, or you're describing codependency, man. Like, they're, they're, they're really kind of these celebrations of black culture are really like kind of disguising these other messages that like aren't necessarily great for us. And so I, I listen, for me, I want more people to be able to enjoy and interrogate at the same time, the same pieces of, you know, instead of canceling a thing altogether out of your life or loving it and defending it to the core, you know, defending it to the quick so that you can listen to a Michael Jackson song. It's like, well, what if you could do both? Yeah. What if you can appreciate it? Appreciate what's amazing about it, what was freeing about it, but also know, okay, you know what? If I were to do it now, I'd leave out that part. Um, and, and so I think that was just, again, me following my obsessions. I wanted those, I wanted to have control over the lyrical content. And, uh, and so using my music was the best way to do it. Um, I grew up loving New Jack Swing. So like to my ear, they sounded great. I brought them to Chris Bowers, who, uh, is a genius <laughs> and our composer. And he was like, yeah, these songs are great. And so he got, you know, he figured out what equipment we would, we would have used in 1989 if we were producing those songs. And uh, he sort of took, you know, the, the little crappy demos that I made with just like he had a, a jam session that he sent to me. And I wrote the, the lyrics and the melody specifically for the film on that one. Just to wrap up, because um, I know you, you, you have to get back to set. Uh, we um, this, obviously a lot of, uh, there are there are a lot of students watching this. What's the one piece of advice you'd give them as they're making their way through their various film degrees and programs? You have to think about the outcome. I know that, but try not to think as much about it. Um, when I say the outcome, what I mean is if you're inspired to make a movie, so many times like I stopped making the thing that ultimately was the thing I needed to make because, well, that's not profitable or no one's looking for that or I don't quite know how to do that yet or you know, what if people hate it? What are the reviews are bad? What if I, what if, what if, what? Try, try to leave that for its proper time and place. There is a part of you that is not logical, that you cannot learn from a book or from a teacher, um, that you can only learn by doing it and learning what parts of yourself to trust. 
and um, give space for that. You know, like so much of my early learning was about like, okay, following the structure and what's this formula and what's that. And if I nail the formula, then the movie's going to be great. And that, you know, if you spend any time doing it as a living, you realize very quickly that is not the case. There are many movies that are written, you know, to the save the cat method by the T that are horrible films, <laughs> you know, at a certain point, like you need the you need the formula, you need to understand the marketplace, you need to make important decisions about your career. All that stuff is true. But there's an artist part of you that doesn't care about any of that stuff that needs, you know, nurturing as well and needs to just follow its obsessions. And you have to find a way to balance those two things. Um, I wish I had, I wish I had, I wish I, I wasn't so obsessed about the right way to do things um, as, as I was, you know, when I first started. Awesome. Um, well, that's all the time we have for tonight's conversation. Uh, please, everyone, give a round of applause, a virtual round of applause for Justin <laughs> for joining us. Um, again, especially in the middle of production, we really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And please continue to enjoy the rest of SCAD's Savannah Film Festival. Yeah.